previous video, we explored the cultural history of gay male relationships, known as danshoku in classical literature. This time we will delve into the invisible history of lesbian relationships. The history of lesbianism in Japan has remained relatively unexplored compared to danshoku. Prior to the early modern period, creative pursuits were almost entirely male-dominated. Women who dared to explore themes of sexuality in their work often faced harsh criticism. Like many other cultures, for a very long time, Japanese women were bound by the societal ideals of chastity and obedience. The earliest surviving references to Danshoku appear in the 4th century Nihon Shoki or Chronicles of Japan. However, the earliest documented reference to lesbianism dates back only to My Princess in My Body, written between 1259 and 1278 during the Heian period. Before exploring this book, let's outline the context in which it was written. The Heian period spanned approximately 400 years, from the time Emperor Kanmu moved the capital to Heian Kyo, present-day Kyoto Prefecture, in 794, until the opening of the Kamakura Shogunate, in 1192. During this time, Japan experienced a cultural renaissance, marked by an aristocracy that highly valued cultural accomplishment. This included poetry and calligraphy. It led to the emergence of notable works by female writers, such as The Tale of Genji and The Pillow Book. My Princess in My Bodies is a decadent, dynastic narrative that explored a broad spectrum of love dramas, including homosexual relationships and incestuous affairs. In one volume, we meet Zen Seigu, a lesbian woman who was a priestess and daughter of the former Emperor Saga in. Following a pilgrimage to Issei Shrine, she decided to stay at her aunt's house for a while. There she slept with many of the women around her. Some of her lovers eventually married powerful men, but secretly maintained a relationship with the priestess, because for them, a relationship with a woman was the ideal. This story sheds light on the existence of secret relationships among aristocratic women during this period. During the samurai era, the tradition of danshoku persisted. It was believed that sexual relationships between feudal lords and their vassals were more pure and ritualistic than those with women, who are often seen as unclean by ancient Japanese Buddhism. This period was marked by constant civil wars, sidelining women from both political and cultural spheres, often relegating them to political marriages aimed at building alliances. The Edo period, 1603 to 1867, brought a more peaceful environment, allowing various cultural forms, including ukiyo e prints, to flourish. Attitudes became more open and permissive with men from different social strata, including farmers and craftsmen, exploring danshok relationships. However, unlike danshoku, lesbian relationships still had no standardized expression to describe them. They were sometimes called ao nei chi in, meaning women who are good friends or kai a wa ye se, which means putting two shells together, and so on. This was largely due to the male-centered social structure at the time, which dictated the themes and content of popular media, such as ukiyo-e. As we saw in our video about hokusai, Wu kyo a artist had a publisher who acted as a kind of producer, ensuring that works met the requests of client sponsors. They were highly interested in the theme of male relationships, but had no interest in the world of women which was largely overlooked. However, tea houses in the licensed pleasure quarters of the Edo period catered to all tastes. Alongside the ka gay ma young men who sold their bodies to male customers, 
were an unnamed group of young women who entertained wealthy female guests. The arrival of the black ships in 1853 forced Japan to open up to the Western world, which introduced new values and ideas. This encounter led to the rejection of Danshok customs. And in 1872, Japan's first law restricting homosexuality was enacted, focused primarily on outlawing sodomy. However, lesbianism remained largely ignored, leading to misconceptions and discrimination. This seems to have had a significant impact on the acceptance of relationships between women in modern Japan. In the absence of any long-standing cultural history, lesbian relationships continue to be viewed as weird and alarming. At present, far fewer women identify themselves as lesbians compared to other minorities, including gay men and transgender people. Jonko Mitsuhashi, a researcher in the history of society and culture, says, globally, the number of people who transition their gender from male to female is roughly double compared to the people who transition from male to female. In Japan, however, the reverse is true. The number of women who transition to being male is three or four times higher. This has attracted attention in international academic circles as a unique phenomenon in Japan's, but for some reason it is not widely reported in the local media. Why? Mitsuhashi suggests the long history of ignoring lesbians is perhaps one of the principal social factors affecting decisions. In the early 20th century, Hiratsuka Lai Cho, a writer, journalist and pioneering feminist in Japan, bravely came out as a lesbian in a literary magazine called Seito, or the Blue Stocking Society, which she founded. She openly expressed feelings for her female lover, O. Take Beniyoshi. Unfortunately, Beniyoshi felt compelled to leave the Blue Stocking Company after fierce public criticism following a succession of scandals. Quite apart from her relationship with Reicho, she was condemned for drinking in bars alone and visiting the Yoshiwara brothels. Even today, there is a hardline minority that considers women drinking alone in bars to be scandalous behaviour. Just under a hundred years ago, these liberated blue stocking pioneers were sarcastically referred to as the new women. From around the end of the 19th century to the beginning of the 20th century, S relationships referred to the intimate bonds between female students and occasionally female teachers. These relationships were a form of sisterhood, with lower-class students referring to their upper-class counterparts as my big sister. As you may recall, this is how Yoshiwara apprentices refer to their oiran. Like real sisters, they shared their secrets and experiences, but were governed by strict rules that emphasised permanence and purity. This phenomena seems to have been closely modelled on the 18th century British Lady Alangolin or the 19th century Boston marriage model. Many well known writers contributed works in the S relationship genre. For example, The Flower Stories, written by Nobuko Yoshiya, and The Harbour for Girls, written by Yasunari Kawabata. If it seems strange that a prominent male author was writing quasi-lesbian literature for young girls, it is important to recognise that the S concept was created and promoted by powerful men through popular magazines. At this point, we should pause to reflect on Japan's long-standing cultural obsession with schoolchildren. The previous Dan Shoku story also highlights the exploration of adult themes in a school setting. Fans of Japanese cinema, anime and manga cannot have failed to notice the frequency with which the protagonists are high schoolers. It could be argued that many Japanese see this period, 
despite the tremendous pressure to achieve exam success as the high point of their lives. A time of relative freedom before they have to conform to the strict social norms of the workplace and family life. If you've seen a previous video about kawaii culture, these escapist forms of infantilization will be familiar to you, including the social engineering role adopted by popular children's magazines of late 19th century and early 20th century. Shoujo originated as magazines targeted at girls from wealthy families who could afford to receive higher education in a women's school after the age of 11. As in many other developed countries at that time, they mainly taught etiquette and how to become a good wife and mother. For their young readers, school days were a final taste of freedom before marrying someone chosen by their parents. Magazine publishers were entrusted by government with the duty of educating the public and shaping the next generation. They promoted the pure, unblemished, obedient character that was the fantasy of adult men, not least the fathers of adolescent girls. Professor Kanako Akaida of Ottoman University suggests Adult men at that time considered these relationships as a developmental process before their daughter had a formal relationship with the man who would become their husband. This relationship was conceived as a wholly innocent stage of growth. It was presumed that these infantile attachments would quite naturally be left behind as the girl matured into adulthood and accepted her social responsibilities. Not only does this establish the expectation that heterosexual relationships are the norm, it suggests that adult lesbian relationships are a form of emotional immaturity. However, what these bigoted social engineers did not anticipate was that some young girls loved each other so deeply that they eloped or committed suicide together. Whereas the platonic ASU relationships were referred to as a kind of fake homosexuality, these young women were true to themselves. In 1911, two young women who had been dating since their school days eloped from Tokyo to Niigata and eventually threw themselves into the sea at the prospect of being forced into arranged marriages after graduation. The incident was widely reported throughout Japan as a horrific same-sex love affair. Treating lesbianism as if it did not exist throughout history made this incident more sensational. Many people could accept gay male relationships because they knew about Danshoku. However, there was no clear precedent for passionate relationships between women. Lesbians were seen as women with wholly abnormal sexual habits who perhaps more importantly, were failing to fulfill their national duty as wives and mothers. In the post-war atmosphere of liberation in the 50s, same-sex bars and magazines began to appear. But although the term lesbians finally began to be used, it was often to define what was considered an especially kinky genre of pornography for male consumption further entrenching prejudice against actual lesbians. In the 70s, inspired by the women's liberation movement, some women started to challenge the stereotypical image of lesbians and explore their identities as women who loved women. Nevertheless, being a lesbian in Japan remained challenging. The LGBTQ plus movement suddenly gained prominence around 2010 and has remained a trending topic for mainstream media. It's fair to say that this is largely driven by corporations adopting diversity, equity and inclusion policies that seek to align their profit-making efforts with changing attitudes among young people. But even if it started out as a cynical marketing strategy, Research shows that 72% of the Japanese now believe that that same-sex marriage should be recognised and the number of people opposed has fallen to 18%. By contrast, in 2014, 
just 41% thought gay marriage should be recognised and 37% did not. The late Professor Mark McClelland, a sociologist and Japanese cultural historian, highlighted that LGBTQ plus individuals who restrict themselves to the entertainment world are largely tolerated, even appreciated in Japan. However, when they turn up as your boss, your teacher, your neighbour or even your husband, this still causes a great deal of anxiety and they largely remain a figure to be feared or despised. In Japan, birth, marriage and death certificates are replaced by a single document called the Family Register. The Supreme Court is currently weighing a claim that prohibitively expensive medical costs for gender reassignment surgery should not be an obstacle to people changing their gender on the family register. This is an issue that recently caused an unprecedented rift between the Scottish Assembly and the British government in Westminster. A number of Japanese organisations have submitted a petition, signed by an underwhelming total 15,000 people in opposition to this claim, asking the court not to rule that the current law is unconstitutional. They argue that if the surgical reassignment requirement is deemed to violate the constitution, it could create confusion in society and make it possible for women with male genitals to enter female spaces. They also argue that this could lead to people whose legal status is male giving birth, which from a certain privileged perspective would usher in the apocalypse. At a time when the Japanese government is desperately trying to reverse a falling birth rate and avert the possibility that more immigration will be necessary in the near future, it would appear that reactionary groups are caught between the devil and the deep blue sea. Is it better for a Japanese man to give birth or end up being looked after by a foreigner in your luxury care home? Alas, reactionary attitudes are seldom underscored by basic logic. A complex historical tapestry of human experience has been entirely overshadowed and disregarded, leaving us with little or no cultural heritage related Japanese lesbian. Clearly, this has tangible consequences for contemporary attitudes and behaviour. As we reflect on this invisible history, it becomes evident that while progress has been made in recent years with the growing acceptance of LGBTQ plus individuals, Japan still lags far behind other developed nations. It is impossible to separate this issue from the broader context of social and cultural forces dedicated to propping up the dominant elderly men at the expense of everyone else in society, most especially women. Our hope is that by shedding light on the challenges and resilience of lesbians throughout Japanese history, we can contribute to a more profound appreciation of their unique experiences. It is through understanding our past, including the yawning gaps, that we pave the way for a more inclusive and equitable future for all individuals, regardless of their gender and sexual orientation.